All right, welcome back to Computer Science E75. It's a beautiful day outside, and this is actually a really fun topic, I think. So this week and next, we'll be looking at Ajax, which is all about dynamism built into the client-side GUIs of websites. Uh, it will certainly relate to Project 3, and we'll certainly go, we'll, we'll, we'll actually go beyond uh, what Project 3 covers, since for the most part, Project 3 isolates you to using Google's API and sort of working within their confines. But we're going to start from the ground up today, look how you can roll your own Ajax code and then also look at some of the library options that exist. Um, we will also probably peel back some of the layers of one of the larger pieces of software we demoed a week or so ago, namely the Google, uh, the Google Mashup Map of Harvard, which has a number of interesting JavaScript features which we can use to sort of uh, empower you with some neat features for your own work. Uh, so uh, without further ado, um, Dom, we looked at this a while back, and now it's actually important again. So when did we first take a look at Dom? OK, so in the context of XML, it was useful because XML can be modeled as this sort of hierarchical tree. So we used this back in project one with Pizza ML, and you had to navigate to that uh, big chunk of XML data for the uh, project's menu. Um, and what query language did you use to look up things in that XML file? All right, so hopefully it was XPath at the time, which itself was this sort of uh, file system path-like query language that allowed you to take these steps. The location path was a series of steps, usually along the so-called child axis. But conceptually, the most useful way of thinking about that document at the time was probably in the form of this tree. So in the context now of AJAX and JavaScript, that subject of DOM actually becomes quite useful again. So here's a representative snippet of XHTML. On the top left hand corner, this is a relatively simple web page. It appears to be well formed. It appears, to, it appears not to be well formed. For what reason? All right, so there's no closed body tag. So this <laughs> was not one of those intended lecture examples. Of course, the first question I asked myself, I realized, has a flaw. This is a well-formed XHTML document, hopefully. And it's also valid, because we appear to have embedded tags only where they are allowed here. And that's useful, because now a parser, or say a web browser, can build up in memory a DOM for this particular document. And that's useful, because a number of the tools we'll be using for AJAX are among uh, our JavaScript's DOM functions, functions that allow you not only to take steps throughout a tree structure like this, but also functions that allow you to create new nodes. And that's particularly important or useful in the context of AJAX, which is all about inserting new data dynamically into a web page. So being able to create new boxes like this on the fly with actual code, much like you would, say, in a data structures class, where you're building up an interesting data structure in memory, will we be able to do thanks to JavaScript and AJAX. So absorb this if you haven't already. This is a, an arbitrary graphical depiction of this document. This isn't some sort of graphical standard. It's just boxes drawn as a tree that show the interrelationships among these particular elements. So where to go from here um, moving forward for just reference on some of these things. So these are a few references, one of which I think we pointed out a while back um, on the W3 school site. And you might also find these two other URLs useful as you dive a little deeper into um, JavaScript. So this is where things get interesting now. So somewhere along the line, the major browser started supporting a variant of what's called the XML HTTP request object. This object is what makes AJAX possible. Its existence within uh, modern implementations of JavaScript, uh, JavaScript within browsers allows you to make additional HTTP requests behind the scenes, sort of unbeknownst to the user, without reloading the whole page. So we've sniffed a few of these transactions as, um, as recently as last week, I believe, in the context of a couple of those examples. And today we're going to implement or deploy uh, this type of object ourselves from scratch. So the annoying thing here is that among the major browsers, there was never quite standardization as to how to instantiate this particular object with which to make those behind the scenes calls. And so what you'll see today when we roll our own AJAX code is a number of, dare I say, hacks that allow your code to be cross-platform, work in Firefox, work in IE. And at the end of the day, the functions, the methods that you are able to call in this context of AJAX and this particular object end up being the same. But there's some silliness, some hoops you have to jump through uh, from the get-go to at least give yourself a reference to one of these objects. So here are some canonical references. Uh, the Mozilla stuff, I would say, tends to be among the best. Um, the Microsoft stuff talks specifically to its implementation 
of this particular object. But for the most part, everything we talk about and demonstrate tonight is applicable across the browsers, at least if you respect some of the initial setup. Details. But as promised last week, these JavaScript libraries that exist, whether it's jQuery or YUI or any number of others, they abstract away a lot of these details. But we'll nonetheless take a look, take a closer look underneath the hood. So imagine you have access within the confines of JavaScript or some web page that you know is going to be executed by some browser. Uh, you have the ability to instantiate an object called XML HTTP request object. So ignore, ignore for the moment how you create that. Assume for simplicity that you call new XML HTTP request object. And what you get back is a reference, a variable that represents this object in memory. And it's by way of this object, which you can think of as a black box, you can make any number of HTTP requests back to your own server, have the responses come back to you through that object, again, a la a black box. And thanks to these various methods, can you actually make those requests and field those responses? So these are the methods that you can trust exist within any of the major browsers that support AJAX, or more specifically support this object. And most of them are pretty um, self-described. So the open function we'll soon see comes in a few different flavors with a few different signatures, lets you open an HTTP connection back to some server, uh, back to your server, and request some additional data. It doesn't have to be from the same file, say index.php. It can be any PHP file, any CGI file, any ASP file, but it has to be within your server. Um, that's a topic we'll come back to in our discussion two, a couple weeks' time on security. You may run into, before long, this notion of same origin policies. Browsers are supposed to respect same origin policies, which is to say you can't use AJAX to query other servers that are not the same server from which the JS file came. The idea being here is sort of a teaser. You don't want to be able to have some user visit foo.com. And just because the author of foo.com wrote some mischievous JavaScript, you don't want their visiting foo.com to result behind the scenes to some random request to bar.com or baz.com or some kind of denial of service attack.com because that will then appear, since JavaScript is client side, to be coming from them. So that's one of the motivations for this requirement that if you're using AJAX, uh, within uh, pages you've implemented on your site, any of those callbacks have to go back to your server and not to other servers altogether. This is why, incidentally, in project three, you're implementing this PHP file, whether it's cities.php or whatever you happen to call it, which is effectively acting as a proxy to Google News. Your JavaScript is not querying Google News directly, and it's for that reason. But more on that in a little bit in a few weeks' time. So abort, very easy. If you're making lots of AJAX calls, you want to be able to abort some outstanding call just for performance reasons or because you just don't need that response anymore. The abort function we'll see is useful for that. Get response header or get all response headers allows you access to all of the individual HTTP headers that might come back uh, with the response from your own web server that may or may not be useful on a typical day. Um, but send is perhaps the second most useful function, because once you've opened an HTTP connection to a remote server, you actually want to send a request, whether it's just getcities.php, or maybe it's getcities.php question mark zip equals 12345. So it's the same stuff that we've been doing all semester long, but it's a slightly new interface for actually making those requests, but the same fundamentals. Well, in addition to those methods, this little black box called the XML HTTP request object has a number of properties that expose some useful information as well, both outbound and inbound. So what does that mean? Well, let's um, look at this first one here, on ready state change. What does that kind of sound like, say, in the context of the past couple of weeks' lectures? On ready state change. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, so AJAX is all about sending a request and getting some information back. So that sort of in, implies some kind of state change. You might be sort of wait, sitting there, you, the object, the black box, might be there sitting and waiting for the request to actually get sent. You might send the request and then sort of be there, the black box twiddling its thumbs, waiting for the reply. You, the black box, might get a reply, but then it might be that the error, an error came back, something like a 500 code or a 403 code. Maybe it's a good thing, a 200 code. So in short, there's a number of different states in which this XML HTTP object, uh, request object can be in. And so on ready state change is in effect an event handler that you can register with the object so as to be informed of those state changes. So we'll see that in use in just a little bit. Ready state is a property 
uh, a value that you can read from inside this object that just tells you what's going on inside of it. What is the current state of this object? Is it either uninitialized? You've done nothing with this object yet. No requests have been made. Ha is there an open connection, i.e., you've called open? Has a request been sent, i.e., did you just call the send function? You'd get back a value of two. Those are not necessarily that useful, but what is useful is the number four. Because what that means, if you are sort of sitting there waiting, you now being an event handler, and we'll see all this by way of examples in just a bit, if you're the event handler, you don't really need to keep asking, are you uninitialized, or are you open, are you sent? What you do care about is, has a response come back? Has a response been loaded? So we'll see that we often check for this property called ready state equals equals four for that reason. Uh, response body, response text, response XML, here's where the magic happens. So when you make an AJAX request to your server, whether it's to request more tiles for your map, whether it's to request a list of cities or zip codes, any kind of additional information that you care about dynamically, um, you're going to need to be able to read that into your document. And you can do so by way of one or more of these properties. So if you are simply querying something like cities.php, and again, I'm using this as a stand-in for whatever you call your own script in Project 3, and that script you've decided is going to return a fragment of XML, which our own specification recommends you do, because it's pretty simple to do. Well, if you want to get access to that XML that you yourself have generated server-side, so that you can insert it into your client-side DOM, well, you're going to access it by way of this XML, HTTP request objects, response XML property. If you don't want to return XML, you want to keep it simple and just return some text, like I actually did last week with that small teaser of dynamically integrating, I think, Google's stock price into the current web page. Well, I kept it really simple. I didn't even use XML for one of those examples. I just returned a snippet of text. So response text is a property you can read and grab whatever response came back from the web server. Status similarly gives you um, access to the HTTP headers um, and status text if there's some accompanying uh, error message or good message. So a little more overview, and then let's dive into a couple of examples. So if you are implementing some kind of AJAX call, there's two parts. There's one, the client side code, which means you write some lines of code that create one of these objects that opens a connection to your server that then sends a request. You then have to sort of put that code aside once it's done and then implement the server side code because you need someone to respond to requests from this JavaScript code. So the second part involves writing something in PHP or Perl, whatever the language of choice is. Ajax really has nothing to do with the underlying language on the server side at least. You need to decide what kind of data are you going to return? And we'll see through some examples tonight that you can return any number of formats. Some are sort of clean and, and very tight in terms of space. Some are sort of quick and dirty, but they get the job done very easily. And they are summarized with this list. You can, in writing this server-side script that's meant to just return some dynamic data that's meant to be integrated into your web page, return XHTML itself. You can do all the generation of some new fragment of XHTML, return it, and you can then trust that the JavaScript will just plug, cram that new XHTML into the existing web page. And the browser will render it wherever you tell it to. It's kind of the quick and dirty way of doing it, but it gets the job done and it's fairly efficient. Uh, more sort of, um, sort of kosher way of doing things is to do it by way of XML whereby your server-side script doesn't return prefabbed markup, which itself is kind of sloppy, and also wastes bytes along the wire, because you're sending all of these XHTML tags, presumably, which are just wasting bytes. You can just return XML that's maybe structured with a little bit of metadata, and then let the JavaScript read that data and itself generate new tags, either by document write or the equivalent, or by creating new DOM nodes, as we'll see tonight. Or you can be a little sexier still and use what's called JSON, JavaScript Object Notation, whereby you return really the least amount of information possible, just the data you care about, by way of serializing an array. So you can have an array in PHP, and if really all you care about is returning an array to the browser, an array to your client-side JavaScript code, there's a function we'll see called JSON encode, which takes an arbitrary PHP array, and so long as it doesn't have weird circularity, like loops that you've created within it, it will serialize it, turn it into one big string, get rid of all unnecessary white space, and you can return it as a really lean string of JavaScript code. So that when that JavaScript code is received 
by the browser, you can then tell JavaScript, OK, read this into your own implementation of an array, a JavaScript array, so that I can traverse it um, as I would any other array. So it's re you have really have a number of options. And the reason that we in the course, at least, and other people sort of call AJAX, AJAX that's not all capitalized these days is because it doesn't really stand for asynchronous JavaScript and XML anymore because you do have in particular this JSON alternative which is increasingly popular largely because of how efficient it is. It's really using the fewest bytes possible while nonetheless preserving a little bit of metadata in there, a little bit of structure. So you can do some really interesting things and the support for JSON, this is a screenshot from JSON.org that just speaks to how many damn libraries there are that support JSON these days. And there's plenty for XML too, but this is not sort of an up and coming technology. It's, it's already fairly mature. All right, so let's take a look at an example. I'm going to go ahead to uh, tonight's code examples. And there's a whole bunch of printouts tonight, um, which should hopefully serve as a decent reference. Um, slight sorting problem. It goes AJAX 1, AJAX 10, AJAX 11, AJAX 12, AJAX 2. Uh, just because of how the command line sorts. Um, but let me see, question in back. Oh, the light's down. Uh, sure. OK, so with that said, what you have in your hands may look like a lot of code, but there is a lot of copy paste because most of these examples are slight variants of the others as we work from something fairly simple to something increasingly sophisticated. So this first example does this. Let's fast forward to what this thing actually does, which is the following, which is the following, Ajax1. So in AJAX1.html, uh, I have this very simple interface. And this might look familiar from last week, as it was a bit of our teaser. So if I'm going to type in Goog, say, click Get Quote, what I have here, and hopefully one moment, is of course an error. All right. Oh, all right. All right, the tubes are clogged. So it worked. This is the result of an AJAX call back to our own server. And either the connection between my browser and our server was slow just now, or the connection between our server, cs75.net, and yahoo.finance.yahoo.com was slow, because it seemed to take a few seconds. So actually, it's good that later tonight we'll have a nice example uh, that demonstrates how easy it is to add a progress bar to your AJAX interface, which at least makes you feel a little less awkward when wondering if your code's actually working. Um, of course, your first bug in doing that, say for project three, is going to be your progress bar just never stops spinning. So you can still have bugs. It doesn't really hide them. All right, so that's Google's current stock price. So what went on behind the scenes? Well, recall that we can sniff our own traffic here. We can start from uh, scratch here. Well, let me type in MSFT for Microsoft. And let's keep this slightly more visible. Let me click Get Quote. You can see in the background that one happened a little more quickly. What was actually sent across the wire? Well, let's take a look now at our live HTTP headers. So it appears that ajax1.html somehow makes an ajax call, so to speak, to what file? Yeah, it looks like quote1.php. It's apparently some code I wrote arbitrarily named. But what's interesting is that I'm passing in some bit of dynamic data. It looks like I've appended to that URL, quote1.php, this thing here. Question mark symbol equals MSFT. So somehow I'm now providing that information, and it's clearly coming from this form. So what's going on behind the scenes here? Well, let's take a look at ajax1.html. Notice that at the very top of this file, inside my head tag, I have the following JavaScript code. And this is sort of the way to implement an AJAX call from scratch without using a library that abstracts away annoying cross-platform issues, but rather we're implementing it ourselves in such a way that it should pretty much work on any major browser. Um, in the one case, pretty much Safari, Firefox, um, and the like supports the first branch in this try-catch block, and IE exists for the second one. So let's take a look here. So this function called quote looks vaguely like this. Not too much to it. There's a handler function we're about to see. So let's look at the XHTML and infer how this thing gets started. So it looks like the following is happening. Here's my form down at the bottom of the page. It looks like on the submission of this form, a function called quote is invoked. Why, though, do I have this here? Return false. Yeah, so you've probably encountered this maybe by accident already. If we don't short circuit the form submission, we're going to induce our AJAX call, but the whole page is also going to reload, which is precisely the 
feature we're trying to avoid in the first place. So there's different ways of doing this. If you're using instead like an on-click handler, you wouldn't actually get submission. But if you're relying on form submission, which is triggered by either clicking a submit button or just by hitting enter, we need to short circuit the form submission. And by saying return false in the little handler code here, that just tells the browser, do this line of code, but don't go any further than that. All right, another trick, incidentally, is you could do something like this. In case you see it this way, you could return your own function, but what do you have to make sure you do within your own function? Just return false. So if you don't like the two lines of code in there, fine, you can simplify it to one. All right, so now we can take a look at our quote function. So that's up here. So quote takes no arguments, and it apparently does the following. So I have this xhr variable. Now where is that coming from? Well, a little higher up here, I have what I've defined to be effectively a global variable. So there's different ways of declaring global variables in JavaScript. Uh, the most straightforward one is to declare a var in what appears to be the global scope. So not inside of a function, not inside of any curly braces, but in this case, right smack dab inside of the script tag that itself is in the head tag. But there are some other subtleties. For instance, if you are within a function in JavaScript that you're writing, if you type var foo, that's going to be a local variable for that function. If you just type foo equals three, semicolon for instance, you've not created a local variable. You have now just created a global variable by omitting the var keyword altogether. So a little bit of a little subtlety, but you can't really go wrong by just always putting var down. Um, since it more clearly, I think, scopes your variables to, uh, to meet your expectations. But and it would also be arguably a little weird to declare a global variable dynamically within a function call. It, it's probably sloppy if you're doing that. But let's fast forward here to see where we're using this variable. So I appear to be doing this. And this is sort of the nice, clean, makes total sense way of preparing for an AJAX call. You instantiate a new object of type XML HTTP request calling effectively its constructor. And for those of you who might have read ahead, I'm really abusing these terms here. JavaScript doesn't really have classes per se. It doesn't really have constructors per se. But we'll see over time that you can mimic that behavior in such a way that it not only looks like calls you might be familiar with from other languages, it also acts the same way essentially as well. But there's a problem here. Because if you are Internet Explorer 7, that doesn't really work. And so you will get an exception because that object, that class, does not actually exist. And so normally you're not supposed to, as you're taught, say, in a programming course, use try catch blocks for logic control, which this effectively is. But this is what we have. So this is how you implement cross-platform support for an AJAX calls preparation because the first block of code will fail, will throw an exception, if you're running, say, Microsoft Internet Explorer. And as a result, you'll catch that exception. And then you'll infer that, oh, it must be IE. Let me create it in this other manner. Have they fixed that in IE 8? They might. I've not dabbled with the, the beta myself, but hopefully. So hopefully. Yeah, there's no way to tell what the browser is running under? No, you can. Um, and there are other tricks for detecting with high probability the browser. So in theory, you could take an if-else approach and do it that way. The world has pretty much done it this way, though, because this is guaranteed to work. And there are other subtleties where you can check, for instance, for the existence of some DOM property that just so happens only to exist in IE. But this achieves the same result, and it will guarantee, uh, will work uh, with guarantee. Other questions? Okay. okay, so at this point in the story, we now have the ability. Yes, if you wanted to not have the explicit return false in the handler code. Yep. Sure. OK, so at this point in the story, these dashed blue lines, we now have stored in the XHR variable, XML HTTP request, that's all it stands for, we have a reference to this object that supposedly provides us with all of this power. So what are we going to do with it? Well. One, we're just going to make sure that this thing's actually going to work. So a little sanity check. If this thing is still null at this point, and it just so happens that the first try failed, not because they're using IE, but because they're using Netscape 1.0, let's at least handle this in this code um, a little more elegantly. Whether or not you care to do so these days is up to you, but that's how we might check for that. And notice that works because I initialized this thing up the front to null itself, not to say un, uh, it's not an undefined value. All right, well, now there's really not much. In these next four lines of code, I am 
I'm making an AJAX call to go get that latest stock quote. So, what do I do? First, I'm just constructing a string. I'm calling it URL. It's a local variable. It's hard coded as quote1.php question mark symbol equals something. So, I'm using JavaScript's plus operator to concatenate the following. Well, what am I concatenating? Well, let me move this onto a separate line for the moment, just because it's wrapping a bit long. So all I'm doing is calling document.getElementById, which is one of the most robust ways to get a very specific DOM node from your tree. Uh, I gave it an ID apparently of symbol, though even I didn't notice when we were looking at the XHTML a moment ago, and I'm getting its dot value. So a common newbie mistake, to be honest, is to, for, to forget the dot value. That's kind of key. Otherwise, you're trying to pass in the node itself, not the value of that node. So where did this ID come from? Well, let's just fast forward back to the XHTML. Ah. OK, so there is that input element. I gave it an ID of symbol because it allows me to very directly gain access to that, um, that DOM node. So there's different ways we can do this. You, you've seen you have the ability to traverse a DOM. You can get elements by class name, by tag name. There are other ways to do this. I would say the most robust, and certainly the way I tend to approach this, is by giving particular fields that I care about a unique ID, because then I know exactly how to get at that uh, DOM node. And it works quite reliably. All right, so now let's take a look back at this code here. So Vim syntax highling seems to break once in a while. We now, have a uh, we now have a variable that's of type string that contains the URL we want to hit. It's a relative URL. I'm assuming this is going back to my own server. How do I do something useful with this? Well, notice that I'm saying the following. First, I'm registering an event handler by way of that property we talked about a moment ago. So there's this property, on ready state change, that you can assign a function pointer. Or really, you can the name of a function in, so that when this thing's state changes, this object changes state, it sends a request, it changes its status, it gets a response back, it loads that response, you will be informed because this function will get called. Now, you might not care about all the many ways in which the state can change, but we'll see that I am checking for the one I care about when it's equal equals four, which was loaded. We are sort of good to go with the response. Well, how do you open the request to the server? Well, you simply call XHR open. You have two different methods to choose from, pretty much, get or post. Really no need for post here. I'm just going to go with get. The second argument to this open call is the URL that I created earlier. And then true. What does true refer to? Can you infer from the signatures here? Yeah, so asynchronous. Now, you might think that you kind of get asynchronicity for free, given that you're using AJAX, asynchronous JavaScript and XML, but you can override that. So what does that mean? Well, usually when you're writing functions and calling functions, if it's a really slow function and you call it, well, you're just going to sit there waiting until that function's done executing, it returns its value, and then your logic proceeds to flow further. Well, that's not necessarily the best thing in what's supposed to be a very dynamic GUI where the user might click over here and over here, and you might actually want things to happen sort of on their own time, um, not uh, without interfering with the user's own interactions with the page. Um, if you think back years ago, it wasn't that long ago when you used to go to file and print and print a 20-page document, you would wait until the whole thing had printed out. And that was for reasons of threading, because you didn't have multiple threads running at one time. But it's the same idea. That print job was synchronous because it had to finish before you could go about your own business. Well, JavaScript and AJAX in particular is powerful because it can be asynchronous. You can be doing multiple things at once. And when that AJAX call is ready to give you some data, it will get in touch with you, not the other way around. So for the most part, this value should probably be true in your own code. But if for some reason you want this to be a blocking call, you make the request of the server and you want your code to wait, to wait, to wait until the response comes back for whatever reason, you have that ability to do so. All right, finally, send. Um, send, you can pass in here some post data if need be. Since I'm using get, I'm just passing in null to be explicit. And that has sent the request. So that's it. Where did this request just go? Well, it went over to the, my local server, to relative call, cs75.net. It's invoking quote1.php. Let's assume for the moment that that thing's doing all the magic of querying Yahoo, getting the current stock price for that symbol, and then spitting back some value. What happens next, the moment quote1.php responds to me? Where does the flow of logic go next? 
Yeah, so it goes to that, that event handler, right? This code is done executing, and as we saw, the page didn't reload. In fact, it appeared nothing had happened, but that's because the browser did eventually invoke this function, the handler, but only once the state of this XML HTTP request object had changed, changed to a value of 4. So here's the flip side. Now I've made the request with my quote function. Quote one dot PHP executed. So step three of three here is my handler function gets invoked. My handler function is apparently checking. Eh, I don't really care about any state changes other than success. Did this actually work and come back with a response? So when that ready state equals equals four, I then want to do one more sanity check. It's all fine and good for the response to have come back, but it doesn't mean it was a good response, right? I might have requested a bogus URL. There might have been a server side error. Um, any number of things could have gone wrong. Let's at least double check now is the status of this HTTP response, that good one, the one you never see, 200, and if so, Go ahead and call the alert function. Well, what do you want to tell the user? Well, this XHR object has, again, all of these properties, one of which is response, uh, one of which is response uh, text, and that literally contains whatever the web server's response was, which apparently is just what? There's no XML, there's no JSON, what was returned apparently? Just the price, just a string, just a floating point number. So one of those forms. Okay, there's a question here. Yeah. Uh, does the handler get called for states one, two, three, and four? All states, yes. Any state change, but I have consciously decided to only care about the last of those state changes. Other questions? Yeah. So if there was a redirect or something like that in that post, the browser would handle redirect. No, so redirect should be handled by the browser, thankfully. So if you get back a three oh well, is this true? I am almost positive, and I'll verify this offline, that yes, the browser should handle for you any 301s or 302s, do the redirects for you, and then finally return to you uh, the right response. But don't quote me on that, because I've never, since I'm always writing my own server side code, I always know what URLs I want to hit. So let me verify maybe during break. Really good question. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, say again? So on here, the XHR, the ready state change equals handler. Okay. This is what's called your handler function, yes? Yes, correct. Okay. You didn't have parentheses next to handler. Ah, okay. Good. So much like the C++ or C where you can pass functions around by way of their names, which really means by way of some pointer to them, it's the same thing in JavaScript. Simply by writing the function's name, I am registering as the function that should be called that function. If I put parentheses there, I'd get unintended behavior. What would happen if I actually suffixed this string with a pair of parentheses? Right, so the moment this line of code executes, the right hand side of this expression would evaluate. That is, the function would get called. The handler function, so far as I recall, doesn't actually return something, so undefined would be the value that comes back. So then I'd be assigning to on ready state change the property an undefined value which means the Ajax call might still go out, but when it comes back and the state changes, there's nothing else is going to get called. So by omitting the parentheses, I'm saying don't call this function now, call it later. And to maybe make this a little more clear, what I could do is something, I'm not sure if this is good or bad, but it's at least another uh, something to tuck away in your minds. I could have done this too. Uh, it's a little weird, and it doesn't gain us anything in this context, but if you're sort of starting to fall in love with these anonymous functions, this would be another way of implementing the same idea. I'm creating on the fly an anonymous function, and that function itself calls, when executed, the handler function. But simply calling this line of code, function parenthesis, curly brace, whatever, close curly semicolon, doesn't call that function because the function function, think of it as returning a pointer to the newly created function. That was a lot of uses of functions. So if you don't follow this, just go back to version one, which I think is much more straightforward. Yeah, uh, two questions. What happens if you have a bunch of handlers with the same name but different number of parameters? Ah, uh, so that is a good question. So if you have an identically named function with, that takes different parameters, which is possible. 
So if you have, um, if you have, so we've seen already that different functions can have, uh, or some function can have different signatures. So you can implement it with two arguments, three arguments, four, or five arguments. But the problem is, though, if you're passing functions around by name, for instance, open, it therefore is ambiguous as to which of those versions should actually be called. So I don't actually know um, the proper answer to that. So that too, let me play with it during break and figure it out. You, you can work around that and explicitly call the right one, as we've just seen by way of the anonymous function. But th I should have a smarter answer to your question. So let me come up with it. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, no, not without shutting off all of the lights. I, I will drop them a note. Yes. Uh, how would you call a function with arguments in the first place? How would you call in this context here? Yeah. So we could do this. And this. You, have this function. you could do an anonymous function, yes. Yep. Other questions? I'm sorry, oh, where, where is quote 1.p? OK, so let, let me pause for just a moment, make sure there are no questions about the JavaScript, and then we'll look at step two, which was that PHP call. Anything else? OK, so let's leave this code as it was when we started and look at quote 1.php. So there's not that much code here. And in fact, you've seen and used this code before, because this is presumably code very similar to what you wrote for project two when your own quote 2.php or by 2.php or whatever you called your files that were actually contacting Yahoo for stock prices, um, it probably looked a little something like this. So I have an F open call here to Yahoo's server. Um, and again, I copied this from project two or directly from Yahoo's own website. I'm passing in to this file here, quotes.csv, a question mark, S equals. And then recall that S denotes the symbol that you care about. So I'm literally passing in directly the value of symbol that was provided in that XHTML form. And then I'm using this format string, which I forget offhand what these various values return, since you have to kind of look it up in that chart unless you remember from the project. But I think I'm getting the price, the high, and the low. I think those three things. But don't quote, don't quote me on that. Well, once I get back this response, what do I do? Well, I call f get csv on that handle. And that gives me back the first and hopefully only row, because I'm only passing in presumably just one symbol. I'm making sure is that data false. And you know, let me make sure that the first column doesn't have NA, which empirically I determined happens if you pass in a bogus symbol. Yahoo tends to return NA in the first in the top left-hand corner of the CSV file. And if it is in fact OK, I'm just printing it out. So when I said a moment, when you said a moment ago that all this file is returning is a price, a string, a floating point value. It is because of that one line of code. The print call is returning a page that looks terribly simple. It just contains whatever that discovered stock price is. So we can mimic this very simply. Let's take a look at our little sniffer here. Recall that the very first thing that happened in the Ajax call was that we called this, uh, this uh, we executed this get request. So let me go ahead and copy that URL. And we can actually do this manually. Let me paste it in literally to a browser. And what I should get back after a moment's pause, since it's contacting Yahoo, and apparently the speed tends to differ sometimes, is I should get back. There we go. 1959. Now it's just a web page, and even that is a bit misleading. It's not even really a web page because I haven't included any markup. If I really dig in deep, what is the content type of this page by default? So it's text slash HTML. So I'm being a little sloppy here, because clearly I'm returning just text. But you may recall that with PHP, if you don't call header content type colon something, well, it's just going to return text slash HTML, which in this case isn't a problem. Response text on the JavaScript side can read this just fine. But if I really wanted to be precise, I, I probably should have done something a little closer to this. But again, in practice, it really doesn't matter here. I really could have done something like content type text plain, because that's really all I'm returning. So maybe if that makes it more explicit as to what's happening um, in your own mind, by all means, include something like that. Okay. Any questions? Yeah? So if you're returning, if you were to do that, but also if you were to call this um, the other page you were on and have this header statement, wouldn't that cause a problem because you're changing the header of the page you were Um No. So this is not the same page. So in Ajax call, forks off a thread to go request this new page, it can be completely different. It can be a binary GIF file. 
um, whereas the origin page was obviously a .html file. So that is not at all problematic. All right, I see. So it gets it back, but it just gets it back to the data, essentially. Correct, correct. So this is, a, if this is as though behind the scenes the browser is allowed to pull up other, uh, other uh, pages in, say, a ta an invisible tab and then grab arbitrary pieces of data from it. In this case, we're grabbing all of the data and just calling alert to display it. Um, but we'll see in just a moment that we can be more sophisticated and actually embed that price back into the original page. Would it do anything insane if you had a redirect in the uh, Oh, so good question. And let me, why don't we do this? So rather than do this during break, it's a very interesting question. Let me go ahead and do the following. I'm going to make a copy of quote1.php and call it uh, quote1.5.php. All right, so now I'm going to go into quote1.php. And just to be difficult, just to be difficult, I'm going to delete all this hard work. And I'm going to do header, uh, location, uh, HTTP, uh, www.cs75.net, lectures, nine, source, quote, 1.5.php, which is the original file. I don't have to call exit, because nothing else is going to get spit out. But if I really wanted to be anal to be clear, the redirect is all that's actually happening here. I could do that. So let me save that. Do I need to change my ajax1.html page? I heard one yes and a few head shakes. So no, because my goal here is to have ajax1.html still call quote1.php, but let the server then say, no, 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 you don't want quote1.php. You want quote1.5.php. So the redirect response will go back to the browser, uh, this case being uh, 301 or 302. We should be able to see that if we sniff it. Let's, the question at hand now is, because uh, David doesn't know, is the browser going to handle the redirect for us, or do we have to handle it in our own handler? So we shall see. I'm as curious as anyone. All right, so let's go back to Ajax 1. Let's go ahead and reload here. Just a quick sanity check. If I zoom in on this page here, notice that the action line isn't, uh, there is no action line because we're calling the function quote. But the quote function, meanwhile, still goes to quote1.php, as we can see right there in the middle. All right, so let's go ahead and keep our sniffer up, clear it so that we know exactly what's happening, close that source code. I'm going to go ahead and type in YHOO, click get quote, go back here. Let's see what happened. OK, so David learned something new. Oh, damn it. Oh, so that's what's happening. So it is handling it, but I screwed up with my little bug. Well, sort of, yes. So if I were doing this with mod rewrite, I probably would have had a clever little line using the dollar sign notation that would have included the original arguments. Let's go ahead and mimic that and pass in question mark symbol equals get, get underscore symbol. OK, close quote, close parenthesis, semicolon, agreed? OK, so what, what just happened, actually, it worked. The browser handled the redirect for me. But unfortunately, it redirected me to quote 1.5.php nothing, which meant my quote 1.5.php file worked, but it had no symbol to get, so it just returned back some empty text. But it was precisely that empty text that we, you may have noticed was displayed nonetheless in the alert window. So let's take a look at the better version of this intentionally uh, tricky code. So let's, uh, I'm running out of symbols that I know offhand. How about uh, RIMM for research in motion? Get quote. Cross your fingers here. It's really time for a progress bar. Uh oh. What well, just happened here? Let's do this once more so we can actually sniff it as we go. All right. So it went to where we expected quote1.php, symbol equals RIMM. It removed temporarily. No, oh, but the browser did not. Didn't get the, uh, didn't get the get line, didn't get the no, it did not. Something is buggy. Did you save your I'm sorry? Did you save your no. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, you expect too much? Okay, I think that was the bug. <laughs> okay, so David learned two things today. Okay, all right, we got our little sniffer here. <laughs> No, that's OK, because it's in the curly braces. It's OK to nest quotes in that weird way if you've got the curly braces. So let's go ahead and click Get Quote. 
There we go. OK, so this is actually good, because if, if AJAX and browsers do not support the automatic handling of the redirects, it just means more work for us, frankly. So sorry that took a lot long. Uh, that's uh, a little ride for me on some, some new knowledge there. But in short, to summarize, if, if I was a little unclear, we just simulated an HTTP redirect by bouncing the user from quote 1.php to quote 1.5.php. We, the second time around, included the symbol information. We included the user data. The takeaway then, if not clear, is that the browser itself realized, oh, that's a temporary redirect, a 302. Let me take it upon myself to follow that redirection pointer and send you ultimately the very last response in any kind of recursion. Yeah? Just oh, do you want to test other browsers too? <laughs> No. So if you tried to redirect off the server, you could bounce the request to another server. It would go back to the browser. Rather, the short answer is it depends what you want to do with the response. If you try to embed that data into your own page, it's not going to happen. So you can make the request, but it isn't necessarily going to allow you to insert the data anywhere. All right, so just to be difficult, get quote, still works. Ha. Huh. All right. <laughs> You want to try Chrome? If works in Chrome, probably works in Safari, G-O-O-G. All right, so if you're testing for projects, you test three major browsers, that's pretty good so far. Um, Opera, though, Opera and other, SeaMonkey, we'll leave those alone for now. All right, other questions? That was a fun one. All right, so let's now do a little something more interesting than these very um, tame, whoops, I'll uh, go back and restore quote1.php from backup since we just clobbered it. Uh, let's take a look at AJAX2 and actually do something a little more interesting with the response. So in AJAX2.html, we have the same kind of interface, except we now have a text field for the price. So we're kind of taking baby steps to a more interesting interface. Alert really is not all that compelling. It's annoying, and it also doesn't allow you to really seamlessly update your UI. So let's try something like this, G-O-O-G. Let me click Get Quote. Now, again, after some delay, it seems, we should see the price come back and end up, if all is well, inside of, oh, you know what? This example, too, uses quote1.php. Damn it. <laughs> um, OK, stand by. 10. Uh, whoops. Good. OK, let me copy that instead of VI. Uh-huh, uh-huh. There we go. OK, so now nothing in the past 10 minutes just happened. We've restored back to normal. And the only difference here is that instead of calling alert on that return text value, we're starting to insert it into our DOM. But I'm not very sophisticated at this point. I know nothing about inner HTML. I don't know how to create DOM nodes. But I kind of know how to manipulate text fields, because we did that for Project 2 a little bit. You're certainly doing it for Project 3. It's pretty easy to get and change the dot value property of something like an input element. So what's going on behind the scenes here? Well, in AJAX 2, we have the very same setup as before. Really, nothing has changed. But what probably has changed inside this file? I'm sorry? The handler. So definitely the handler. Obviously, the XHTML, because the form looks a little different. Let's take a quick look at that. So the form is different only in as, insofar as it has two input fields. But notice I've given them both IDs so that I can very easily access the one I want. But the handler function is a little different. Not very different. One line of code difference, but we're again taking this step toward a more interesting response. So now, if I check that the ready state is 4, which means the response has been loaded, you're ready to play with this information. The HTTP status is 200, which means that's it. This is a good response. What am I doing now? Well, I'm again, as I've done in past exercises, grabbing the value of that input element and setting it to xhr.response text. It's wrapping a little bit, but this is just that one property that we promised just has the raw response, excuse me, the raw response that was returned from the server. And just to make a little more clear, since we've kind of wrapped up an interesting step with Yahoo involved here, if I temporarily go back into quote1.php and suppose again I get a little frisky and I want to skip all of this code and I just do something like closed for business and then exit there. This is still a working file, but what's going to happen now, since I'm only relying on that response text property, is if I type in msft and type get quote, 
I get back that string literally. And just to be even more clear, if I've just got some garbage in this price field, I'm going to clobber it when I type in that code because, again, it's just changing that value. So that's all that's happening there. And quote one is the same file underneath the hood. So really, we've only changed what we're doing with that information. So any questions on this baby step? Yeah? How would you change an image as opposed to a text? Mm. OK, so that's several steps ahead. Um, you can use response body, which was one of the other properties. And the examples I have here today don't have that, but it's very similar in that you could change the, uh, the source attributes value for an image tag, for instance. You could change the source or insert a new DOM node altogether. OK, so let's take things up one more notch. Ajax3 now does something more similar to what I think we concluded with last week. So now I got rid of the text field because it's a little hackish just to be using these basic UI mechanisms just to insert text because you know the user can highlight the text, delete it, mess with it, and it's just not a clean interface. So now let's just have this placeholder to be determined. Let me go ahead and type in something like goo, click get quote, and now I'm actually updating dynamically it seems the body of the page by clobbering whatever that DOM element is. Now what is it? It's probably a span is probably what I put there. I need some kind of element to change the contents of. So let's take a look, not so much at the code yet, but this time at the, the XHTML. What did I wrap my to be determined in? Whoops. Indeed, it was a span. And I gave that span an ID. Because now I wanted an inline element. I didn't want a block level element like a div that would take up the whole rectangle on the page. I just want to change that bit of text. So I signed in an ID of price so that in my handler, which again is the only thing that's going to have changed here, I'm now doing this trick. So this is that thing I mentioned last week. is isn't technically standards compliant, but it's done all over the place. It works really well. And it also is arguably more efficient than it creating a whole lot of DOM nodes or a whole lot of XHTML on the client side. Because if your server is just way faster than your clients and you can cache output on the server anyway, this is in practice a very useful mechanism to render your XHTML on the server and then just plug it in to this property called inner, inner HTML within JavaScript. And we'll see some more examples in a bit that show you what it means to not take this route. And you hopefully get a sense of why it's just expensive to start creating a whole bunch of XHTML dynamically on the client side. But the only difference here is now I'm getting element by ID. And I'm not getting dot value because spans don't have values per se. Input elements have values. Spans have HTML inside of them. So inner HTML means take whatever's between the open span tag and the closed span tag and change it to be this XHR dot response text. And what's really neat now about some of these tools we've been preaching is the following. If I go ahead and let me reset this page, let me open up Firebug for a moment on this page, and let me take a look at my, uh, at my HTML here. So this is Firebug on Ajax3.html. I'm just expanding a few things. Notice down here I'm at the span with an ID of price. So there is the XHTML as it was sent from the server. What's neat about Firebug, too, is it's constantly listening for DOM changes, too. So if I go ahead now and in the web page, type in something like Yahoo for a uh, ticker, click Get Quote, watch the bottom left, not the top left of the screen now. So even Firebug has drawn my attention to it by just highlighting it. But we see that the DOM has actually changed to contain this new 14.42. And in fact, what disappeared from between those two tags? There was even more. There was the B tag. So you can completely clobber all of the XHTML, all of the hierarchy between the two tags, open and close, whose ID you're using to go insert this new HTML. So it's really neat and really easy to do this stuff. Let's take a five minute break. All right, so a quick word on Project 3. This came up once or twice on the bulletin board, but some of you might have realized that there appear to be duplicates of sorts within the big CSV file that you're meant to import. Uh, this is because the data itself has many different views sometimes of various towns and cities. But as we've, Chris and I said on the bulletin board, you can handle these duplicates in a couple of different ways. The right way, according to the people at zipcode.com, is to only import the rows from the CSV file 
for which the primary record field, or primary field, I forget what the column is called, has a P in it. And you'll see that if there's some set of rows for, say, Boston, Mass, they might have Boston, 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 Boston. They might even have all the same population counts, but some of the fields might differ farther out in the rows. It suffices to just import the row for which primary record is a quote unquote P, a single character. Another approach that Chris Power was alluding to on the bulletin board this weekend was you can also, and it's a little hackish, but for our purposes, since we're not using most of the data from the file anyway, gets the job done. You could, in theory, define a joint primary or joint unique key on both name and zip code. And by doing that, if you try inserting the same city, comma, zip code again and again and again, only the first is going to succeed. The rest you'll get MySQL errors, which you can suppress or just handle in your own way. Because again, this script's meant to be run once. It's meant to save you time, get the data into the database. So if it's intentional on your part that you only want the first one inserted, that's fine. But the right way, the clean way, um, again, according to the folks at zipcodes.com, is just to import the row for which P uh, is present in the row. It's not a big deal, though. And the reason the spec does not talk about this is because it's completely fine if you interpret the data a little bit differently. Again, we're only using a few of the fields. But it's representative of an a interesting real world problem where you have to decide how to, how to um, import this data. So two different ways. And it's also discussed on the bulletin board. All right, so uh, Ajax4. .php does something a little differently, but it's taking things up a slightly bigger notch. This time, I decided to get a little more data than just the price. So I've sort of regressed a little bit, such that I'm now just using a text area. And I like the text area because it lets me have carriage returns and new lines and such, so I can have more data than just a input element allows. But let me go ahead now and type in something like goob, and let's see what we get back. So after a little bit of churning, we get back this. So I'm still taking sort of the poor man's approach. I'm not returning anything fancy. There's no structure. There's no boldface. There's no XHTML per se, just text, probably with new lines. But now I at least have the ability with the text area to see multiple lines of code. So again, it's not that useful. But now we clearly have the ability to get back multiple pieces of data. So I could, because you know I know how to program. I know how to loop over a bunch of lines that have new lines uh, separating them. You know, I could write a parser of sorts, maybe using regular expressions or substrings. And I could extract from this three line response the high, the low, and the price. But the whole point of XML, or the whole point of JSON, as we'll now see, is to actually include a little bit of metadata so that you don't have to sort of take the really low level approach of parsing the very code that you yourself generated, doing a little more effort on the server side, maybe surrounding. 378.11 with an open price tag and a closed price tag can be huge for you client side in JavaScript because it's so much easier than to get at the value thanks to JavaScript's built in um, DOM functions, built in XML functions, so to speak. So let's take a look at what was actually returned with the back end. Quote 2 is the relevant one here. I got a little more anal and actually returned a text plane header this time because I wanted to return three lines separated by new lines. The Yahoo code is uh, familiar, so it's just the same string I copied pasted from project two. Now notice the only thing that's different is I'm calling print three times and I'm printing three lines of text. The first is price colon something, high colon something, and low colon something. So that's it. But again, I've really not, I've really done the bare minimum here. And it would be particularly annoying to parse this client side, um, certainly if I'm returning more than just these three values. So where can we go from here? So. Ajax5.php improves upon that one still. So I've got a little placeholder here just to prove that we're clobbering some existing value. I can go ahead and uh, expand and firebug what you're seeing within the DOM. So here's the line of code in question. So that's probably going to go away because I seem to have preemptively given this div an ID of quote just so I can get at it very easily. And let's see if that is in fact true. So Goog. Get quote, and a few seconds later, there we go. So again, Firebug's highlighting for us what has actually changed. Uh, notice that we've returned this time, looks like some BR tags. So slightly more sophisticated in that either client side or server side, I'm not just spitting out new lines, backslash n, I'm apparently spitting out some um, BR tags. So let's take a look at this source. This is Ajax5. I'm contacting quote3.php, and I can see that. 
right there. That's the URL I'm constructing. The rest of the code is pretty much the same, but the handler function is using what property? Inner HTML. Because again, we're inserting it into the page, not into, say, some pre existing text field. So let's glance at quote three. PHP. And if I'm moving quickly, again, you do have printouts of all this in front of you. Same as quote to.php, except I am now spitting out text slash HTML, and the mere absence of another content type just means implicitly I'm doing the default. I'm spitting out now price high and low, but separating them with BR tags. Because I kind of know now that I'm going, the destination of this code, I know because I wrote it, is a web page. I don't have an HTML tag, though. I don't have a head tag. I don't have a body tag. Why is that OK, though? Exactly, because I'm inserting this XHTML into a page that already has those prerequisites. Now, it would be an invalid web page if I went to this URL. So if I, instead of going here, went to quote3.php symbol equals goog, because I do get back a response, because browsers are generally very tolerant of the lack of HTML tag, lack of body tag. If I view this page source, that's all that's getting spit out is what I expected. So this is not well formed. This is not XHTML valid. But it doesn't matter, because it's not meant to be pulled up directly. If someone is sniffing my traffic and figuring out what URLs I'm hitting, fine. It really doesn't matter. Um, but what does matter is that the data I'm inserting into my existing web page is itself well formed. So you don't want to spit out an open tag and no close tag, because then you're going to start to break the, the DOM inside of your own page. And that will likely yield some unpredictable behavior if the browser starts getting confused by what DOM elements you're inserting. But this is perfectly legitimate to insert inside of a pre existing div. Yeah? So mm -hmm. you're inserting it, but you still need the header, right? Uh, I need is. is misleading, it, it's good to have so that the browser knows that the data coming back should be interpreted as, as XHTML or HTML. So if I said, for instance, some other content type and I spit out application slash JSON, but I actually returned uh, XHTML, I would hypothesize that the browser's behavior is undefined and weird things could happen. Because the browser is relying on the content type, most likely, these are underlying implementation details, to figure out how much parsing and what type of parsing it should do of that response. Uh, OK. So the browser, yes. So quote3.php is requested by the browser. The response comes back to the browser. The browser then is going to parse that response. Yeah, like the browser is on display, but it still has to parse the response. Correct. Because as we'll soon see through more, uh, more sophisticated examples, the response can come back as text. And you can then get at that text via response text, that property that we've seen in use. If it's XML, the browser will actually parse the XML and build up a mini DOM and then hand you the mini DOM by way of the response XML property. Um, and if it's instead response text, rather, that's what would be useful for JSON code. So it really is important for XML versus everything else. So good practice to spit out the appropriate MIME type, because I would, again, hypothesize that the behavior might be undefined on the browser's part if you're saying one thing and sending another. OK. Other questions? OK. So we've integrated it a little more seamlessly. Again, this is AJAX 5. It in integrates it via the inner HTML property. Well, what more can we do from here? So AJAX 6 now finally adds a little bit of progress. It's not sexy, but AJAX 6 gives us this. So quote will appear here. We'll do Yahoo this time. Uh, let's go ahead and expand our body here in, in Firebug, just so you can see a little more behind the scenes. Oh, that's kind of sexy, right? Looking up symbol, dot, 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 sort of a poor man's progress bar. The DOM did change down here. And voila, now it changed again and actually inserted the response. So it's not necessarily the best improvement, because if the server's really slow, it's just going to, in perpetuity, say, uh, getting data or loading data, dot, dot, dot. You know, it wouldn't really be that hard to add an animation. We'll do that in a moment. So there's probably, ideally, in a well-implemented AJAX uh, setup, some kind of listening, not just for success, 
but I probably want to listen for some other things too. So it's a little lazy to just be listening for the ready state of 4 because what if you never get to ready state 4? For instance, the network connection just dies and it never actually loads. So more rigorous error checking is probably in order, at least if you care to provide the user with really rigorous feedback. But for now, it's certainly getting the job done. So what's different here? So this again was the example. Quote will appear here. This is obviously just uh, hard-coded XHTML, the default, because it's just a .html page. So I type in Goog or whatever. I click Submit. The request goes to quote 3 or 4.php, whatever we're up to right now. What also happens the moment that AJAX call goes out on the wire for this example? Yeah, so we're changing the div. So right before or maybe right after that asynchronous call is forked off, I'm probably doing something like inner.html equals quote unquote loading quote or getting quote dot dot dot. Well, let's take a look. Again, the visual effect is this, looking up symbol. I completely forgot my own string. So how do we insert that text looking up symbol? Well, let's look at Ajax 6. Well, let me search for looking. All right, so there it is. So it looks like. The only real enhancement of this page, and it's pretty powerful just to provide a little bit of feedback, is before I actually invoke the AJAX call, I'm also manually changing the inner HTML of that same div to be equals, quote unquote, looking up symbol, dot, dot, dot. So do you already see where we're going if we want to in, uh, set up a little bit of animation? How could we create animation with like a sexy little progress bar? So we could put an animated GIF in there. We know that we can clearly put in text. We've seen how we can dynamically insert things like BR tags. So if you make a bit of a logical leap, feels like you could probably insert an image tag even. Or you could be a little more clean. You could maybe have the image tag embedded in the page already inside of a div. And what could you do by default with the div? So you could keep it hidden, right? You could do display none or, uh, or visibility equals hidden in CSS. So you could either put it there and just hide it, or you could just not put it there at all and then dynamically insert it. And for just doing one node, they're probably pretty equivalent in terms of performance. So let's see if we can get to that. But first, one question here. Well, at this point, I know that the next line of code that's about to get executed is I'm going to try to make this AJAX call. And yes, some bad things could happen in theory. And therefore, it might say looking up symbol dot, dot, dot forever. So I probably want to have this code's probably OK. But I probably want to add some code to my ready, on, ready state, uh, on ready state change handler that gets rid of this text if not just on success, but also on errors and tucks it away. But here in the setup, probably OK. Though I could probably put it after the call as well, because I'm only going to find out, um, well, if, again, if I really wanted to be anal, I would be checking uh, probably the return values of these things rather than relying on the handler to inform me that the state changes. So in short, there's several different ways we could have tackled this. OK. All right, so let's see if we can do something that's visually more engaging. So in Ajax7.php, we finally have an animated GIF. So where do these things come from? Well, uh, Google Images is certainly your friend, or if you have the skills for doing this. Um, if you want a nice little discussion, this is actually a useful site. So ajaxpatterns.org is a really nice site, especially if you're kind of learning this stuff, you're curious what the sort of de facto standards are for various approaches to UI. Um, UI mechanisms are. Progress indicator just talks about the philosophy behind a progress indicator. And a lot of it is just common sense, right? It helps the user know that something's happening. But it's kind of a good material to just absorb or expose yourself to, because even I've sort of picked up things like, oh, I didn't think of that before. And that's useful to know. Um, this first one, ajaxload.info. They were clearly kind of out of better domain names, but ajaxload.info. Uh, gives you this little site, which I've definitely used just because I wanted to make something quick and dirty. Uh, you'll see that we have a whole bunch of indicator types here. So if you like this general indicator type, right, there's a whole bunch. All right, this is really tacky. We can go with this one. Um, how about uh, FFOOOO is going to give me, whoops. Actually, let's leave the background white, uh, foreground color. I know what red is, so do that, generate it. 
It's going to go ahead down here and generate on the fly. Slightly more interesting than the black and white version. So I can actually go ahead and save this. So let me save image as. Um, let's call this class.gif. Save it on my desktop. Or actually, you know what? Let's say, can I? I'm going to copy image location. Save one little step here. Wget. Paste that in. Oh, they seem to have prefabbed a lot of them, it seems. Or they're using mod rewrite in an interesting way. OK, so let's see. It's getting a little long. OK, so 19-0.gif uh, is the file I downloaded. Just so you see that not everything need be prefabbed here. Let me find the GIF that I have. What did I say, 19.2-2? Oh, nope, 19-0. OK, so now we're about to see the animated GIF that we just made on this particular site. Let me go ahead and load now ajax7.html. So nothing's going on just yet. Let's open up the Firebug uh, console to see what's there. So ooh, interesting. It is there. But thanks to some CSS, how is it not appearing? Well, just display none. Right? So if you're kind of shied away from CSS, it's starting to get more useful, especially in the context of more dynamic interfaces. Again, different ways we could do this. But one of the simplest ways is put it there if you know you're going to need it, especially if you know you're going to need it in the same place all of the time, but just hide it by default. And now we'll see a little more interesting JavaScript code, because I'm not just inserting new content. I'm now toggling CSS properties, which was an ability we promised in last week's lecture. So let's go ahead and search for something like Goog. Get quote. Ah, very sexy. Let's see what happens. OK, so a couple changes to the DOM. One toggled those CSS properties. The next one actually changed the content that's in the page. What did I actually insert? Well, let's take a look at this div here. It looks like we're still just spitting out the same boring XHTML structure. It's still getting the job done. So the only difference was, ooh, how did we animate this progress now. Well, it's an animated GIF. You can do that. Uh, can't do it with JPEGs. Uh, GIFs are pretty much the right option for this. So let's see how we did this. So what function would have had to change to implement this progress bar? Was it my quote function or my handler or both? OK, handler? Handler? I actually heard the right answer first, so both. right? Because this time, uh, assuming we're making an inference here, but because the GIF started off hidden, or the div that wraps the GIF started off hidden, odds are the quote function shows it, but the handler function hides it. So it's probably both that actually change. So let's take a look. Quote gets called first. Here's where we construct the URL. It's querying quote4.php. Show progress. How do we do it? Well, we actually saw a line of code like this last time. If I know that the display property is by default um, none, I can just manually change it back to block, which is sort of the default version for a div. And so what this one line of code does, a little verbose, but I know that the div that surrounds that image is called progress, because I gave it that name. So I'm getting its style property, and then I'm getting, in turn, the display property. So display is ripped right out of the CSS handbook, and I'm changing it equal to quote unquote block. And that's it. The rest of the code is the same. But in the handler function, I need to reverse that visual effect. And so in the handler function, I just change it back to quote unquote none. And there's different ways we could do this. We could use the visibility property. We could just remove the DOM element and keep putting it back and forth. Um, this is perhaps the cleanest way, because it's just a toggle, off and on. So it's pretty neat. Any questions? All right, so Ajax 8. So it's getting more and more progressive. Let's see what we do in Ajax 8 that's even more sophisticated still. All right, so now I seem to have placeholders. So this suggests a little more elegance, because if I'm going to insert without clobbering and creating sort of an illusion of updating the fields, I'm guessing that I have three spans there, one next to price, one next to high, one next to low. So it feels like this example, just based on this, uh, this teaser, is going to dynamically insert whatever's returned from the server and plop, um, uh, put part of it up here, another part of it here, another part of it here. So it suggests that we're being a little cleaner now with the data that we're returning. So the effect is going to be this. Let's take a look at the end game. All right, so it's being inserted. Looks the same, but let's see where we started. So let me go ahead and look at the body and Firebug. So it looks like, ah, all right, so it looks a little ugly because I just kind of spaced things out with some BRs for now. But it looks like all I'm doing is I have these, Spans. 
next to each of these fields, so to speak. But each of these spans has an ID. So I am guessing that I have at least three lines of JavaScript code in my handler function now that's going to put the price here, the high here, the low here. All right, so let's see how that's actually done. But first, let's just take a quick look at what, uh, what file is being queried. So quote5.php. Let's see if we can, if we can sort of um, infer how this is going to work. So quote5.php, question mark, symbol equals Goog. Let's see what I get back. OK, interesting. Now Firefox is taking it upon itself to realize, oh, this is content type text slash XML. Let me render it as a DOM rather than as just pure text. This warning message at the top is not a big deal. It just means I'm not really sure how to style this. So let me give you my default boring XML stylization. But it is, in fact, XML. And this little interactivity is just a browser feature, nothing more. If I look at the raw page source, what I'm getting back isn't even pretty printed per se, because a computer's generating it, or my own code is generating it. But here's that metadata that we promised was possible. Now, it's more verbose. There's definitely more characters here than there were when I was just delineating text with a backslash n. But I now have the ability to pluck out arbitrary pieces of information in code. And certainly for small snippets, probably not such a big deal to have to parse a few more characters, especially if you have compression enabled on your web server. All of the redundancy you're getting in some of these tags can probably be, uh, be brushed under the rug anyway, thanks to compression. So let's take a look at what actually is going on in the code. In Ajax 8, I'm querying quote5.php, uh, symbol equals whatever. I make the same AJAX call. This whole time we've been using get, which is fine because we're sending so little information. But the handler function now is a little more sophisticated. All right. So if the ready state's 4 and the status come back, comes back as 200, what do I want to do? Well, notice now I'm using not the response text property, which is for the most part just for XHTML that comes back, text that comes back, and as we'll see, JSON code that comes back. This time I actually want XML. So I'm sort of assuming that this file, quote5.php, is returning XML. It's a pretty decent assumption because I wrote both of these files. But I'm now trusting that because quote5.php returns XML, and to your, to your question earlier, or comment earlier, because it's returning XML and I'm returning the appropriate content type, the browser is going to take it upon itself to read that response, parse it, build up a little miniature DOM. And then if I ask for it by way of response XML, it's not going to hand me a big string of text that just happens to look like XML. It's going to hand me a little miniature tree. And then I can start traversing that tree and pluck out the nodes that I care about. So now in this variable called XML is the root of a DOM. It's not a valid DOM, per se, because I don't have an HTML element, I don't have a body element, a head element, but it is a DOM. It's a tree structure based on the fragment that was returned. Well, what do I do with this data? Or rather, it's XML. So it has a root, so it doesn't have HTML body head, but it does have a root element, which as we've seen has a few children, uh, price, high, and low. So at this point in the story, I now have a reference to a DOM for an XML DOM, how do I get at the interesting data? Well, one way, and there are different ways we can do this, but perhaps a very explicit way is to do this. First, get me an array of all of the elements whose name are price. Now, how many of these elements should there be? There should be one, right? I wrote the code. I can sort of mandate that there's only going to be one. But the JavaScript API for DOM manipulation gives me get elements by tag name. So I'm going to get back an array, even though I know there's only supposed to be one. That's fine, because I know how to get the zeroth element. I can simply use some array notation. So I get back this array of elements called price. I know that there's only one in there, because I'm checking, is prices.length equal, equal to one. And that's just me being a little anal. If I know my code works, maybe I don't have to do this. But again, weird things can happen. Maybe there's a bug in my script, and some bogus data is getting returned. It's good practice, certainly. So prices bracket 0 gives me the first and presumably only price element that's in the XML that's returned. First child, as it implies, gives me the first child. Well, what is the first child of the price node? That's this thing here. What's the first child of the price node? 
It's actual data. So we didn't talk about this in great detail, but even text in an XML document is wrapped up in what's called a node. So an element is a type of node, but there's other types of nodes. There's comment nodes, there's document nodes, there are text nodes. So anything that looks to us like pure text is really a node, a leaf in the tree called a text node. So the first child of price, which is an element, is a text node. But if you want the text in a text node, you need to get that text node or that child's value. And so that's why we go into first child dot node value. So it's not value as it is in the world of XHTML. When we're talking more generically about DOM, it's node value. And the capitalization of the V is important. So beware little subtleties like this. Again, the more JavaScript code you start writing, a first child too has a capital C. Little things like that might be non-obvious uh, depending on your editor, so be careful. All right, so what do I do? I now have in price an element of what uh, what's the data type of the value in price, even though JavaScript's a little loose with data types? Text. It's a text, right? It looks like a floating point number. It looks like a dollar amount, but it came from an XML document, which itself is just text. So it's really just text at this point that looks to a human like a dollar amount. So what do I do with this string? Well, document.getElement of price, that returns the element of what kind of element is that giving me? Yeah, that's the span. So remember, I had that placeholder span with this idea of price. I'm getting its inner HTML property and setting it equal to this string. And that does the insertion. Now, the rest of the code, even though it looks a little long, it's the same thing and the same thing for just different types of nodes or different name nodes. But this, finally, is giving us a little more dynamism that's much more reminiscent of what you see on real sites like Google Maps or Kayak or anything that's Ajaxy these days. It's probably doing something more like this. The rest of the code, though, is precisely the same. So any questions on these, on this approach? Yeah? Uh, what happens if we don't set the content type to uh, HTML and the PHP, uh, to uh, XML and the PHP core page? So that's a good question. Uh, this is where, I, again, I would hypothesize that the browser's behavior is probably a little undefined. Um, we can certainly try as much. This is quote 5.php. I'm explicitly saying text.xml. Let's just try. Let me set it to Plextane and let's, let's see how tolerant, for instance, Firefox is of this gaffe on my part. So let's go back to uh, quote 5. Let me refresh this, see what happens. Now it's clearly returning text because Firefox realizes this is just plain text. This is not XML. I'm not going to waste time trying to render it in this tree fashion because you've just told me that it's text. All right, so that's consistent with the change we just made. Let's see now, and I don't know what Firefox is going to want to do here. Let's try MSFT, get quote. Yep, two errors, in fact. So user age, no, that's irrelevant, that one. That's a, from one of my other open windows. This one, X, whoops, whoops, whoops. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch, console. So this is the error that I just got. So this line of code, var prices equals XML dot get elements by tag name of price. So this error, because it's saying XML is null. Why might XML be null? Where did this XML variable come from? Yeah, so response XML. So it appears that. Firefox is indeed relying on the content type that's being returned from the server to tell it what type of data this is. And because I've not told it anymore that this is XML, it's not even trying to parse it as XML. Now, I could get response text. So just to show that this is, in fact, doing something, let me go back into ajax8.html. Let me go into my handler. Let me go to this line of code. So it's fine if I still try to get response XML, but let me do this, xhr.response text, because my PHP file is still returning something. It's just not XML proper anymore. Let me reload this page. I'm still going to get a JavaScript error, because I haven't fixed that. But if I type in Goog this time, get quote, the request just went across the wire. And in a moment, I'm seeing response text. So something's coming back. But this is where this is maybe the, mo the clearest example yet of the reality that response text and response XML sometimes might both be populated with useful data, but only in cases where it's actual XML that's being returned. Otherwise, only response text is useful. So, good. Excellent question. All right, so let's roll back this change, roll back this change, and take things up one more notch with these examples. And we'll take a look at the map. So this version actually does some DOM node creation. So thus far, we've seen the 
following approach. We have returned very lazily just some ASCII text, um, and we've inserted that. We then took things up slightly more intelligently and started returning a little bit of XHTML. And by that, I mean I returned some BR tags instead of line breaks. So that was a little more sophisticated. We then moved to the XML world. Well, what did I re how did I return this XML, just to be clear? Well, that was quote 5.php really does not take much effort on my part to create XML, as you'll see in project three as well. To create this XML, notice I'm spitting out at the top of the file, quote, and I decided it might be useful to re-inform the browser of the symbol I was passed, so I gave it an attribute, maybe not necessary. But again, instead of spitting out price colon, high colon, low colon, I'm surrounding them with open tags and closed tags. It's that easy to generate XML, whether it's in PHP or any other language. So that was the only marginal improvement there. But I'm doing one thing differently now in AJAX 9. In AJAX 9, I have sort of realized, you know what, this is really a lot of wasted characters. I don't need all these open tags and closed tags. I want something a little tighter, especially if I'm not doing these little baby applications. I'm returning a whole bunch of data. For instance, the Maps application returns automatically that whole list of possible buildings for the autocomplete. I probably don't want to send more bytes than I need to when I'm already sending a list of 500 buildings. So there are certainly applications in which it's easy to generate XML, but do you really need to? Can you be a little leaner than that? Well, in this example here, AJAX 9, notice what I'm doing. So in AJAX 9, I have intentionally sort of taken a step backwards just so I can kind of have a little debugging window. Think of this text area as a debugging window for the moment. Notice that I am apparently calling functions like create element, create text node. So it sounds like this time, instead of just creating strings or inserting prefabbed XHTML, I'm sort of very, sort of the, uh, very explicitly creating the XHTML nodes that I want to insert into this page. Yeah? Uh, you would have to call, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the function. You can't do it there. So when you create an element, you pass in the name of the element, though there might be a version of create element whose second argument is an attribute. But don't quote me on that. I believe you might have to subsequently call div.add attribute, I believe is the call. It's been a while since I um, created nodes manually um, with attributes. So short answer, you can't just create one line of code. If you want to do that, then you're creating raw XHTML. You're not creating DOM nodes one at a time. So what are we doing here? So assume now for the moment that I got back some, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. well, let's take a look. So this example here does the following. Goog, get quote. Let's see what comes back. So is that what I wanted? That was weird. Uh, I don't think I meant to type that out, print that out. All right, so what happened? We actually embedded the quote into the page. So what file have we requested? So this is back to quote1.php. Quote1.php is the simplest of our versions. It just spits out the actual price, and it's using implicitly text slash HTML. So it's really a simple version. So this example is meant only to print the price of this particular stock. So how am I actually inserting it? Well, let's go back to this part here. So let me pull up Firebug. We'll ignore our little debugging window for a moment. Uh, go into the HTML, expand this, and notice that inside of quotes is nothing right now. So that's going to be the destination of my actual data. Well, what data am I going to put there? Well, let's see. So if ready state is 4 and the response is a good one, 200, I'm going to go ahead and insert the new piece of information, sort of the very anal, very sort of low-level data structure way. I'm first going to create a div. Then I'm going to create a text node. And what is the value of that text node? The text node's value is going to be whatever the symbol is that the user typed in, concatenated with a colon and a space, concatenated with the raw response text from the actual server. Okay. At this point, I now am going to append to that div element that child. So now I've created a div in the first line. I've created a text node in the second line. With this third line, I'm appending the text node as a child of the div. So I'm really sort of slowly building up the uh, DOM nodes that I want to create. Then I go ahead and I get the div that I know exists in the page by way of its ID. And that's this thing here. So that's this node here. It's empty right now. Notice it's an empty element. The slash is right there on the edge. So I'm getting that element, and then I'm calling its append child. So what I'm doing is inserting inside of this div another div 
that itself has a text node. And then finally, I just, this was, I think, for, yes, this was for, oh, that's why I did this. OK, it was intentional. It just looks a little weird. Then I show the corresponding XHTML in the text area. So I decided to just show the whole page's source code. This was before, frankly, I had Firebug installed on the computer. So why don't we just get rid of this for now, since that's really not that enlightening. Let's get rid of the text area since Firebug is a much cleaner way of showing what's going on inside the DOM. So here's the DOM in step zero. Step one, I hit get quote. The AJAX call goes, hits the server, quote one.php. That's step two. Response comes back. My handler function is going to create these new DOM nodes. And what's going to happen is I'm going to insert as children of this node or descendants of this node that div and text node that we mentioned a moment ago. So it's gotten highlighted. Let's expand it. And in fact, that's what I've dynamically inserted. So any questions on this DOM insertion? Any question? Nope, didn't need to do it. Didn't need to do it. So I mentioned earlier that the inner HTML property is sort of not quite standards compliant, but everyone does it, or at least I do it, and a lot of people do it. So why is that? Well, so I've actually read up on various reports and studies people have done online just because they have the time to spend on this. And they've done things like, which is faster? Do I just render a whole bunch of XHTML, send it from server to browser, and just insert it via inner HTML? Or do I only send the data? And do I then let the browser create, say, the 100 new div nodes that I want to insert into the page, or the 1,000 new div nodes that I want to insert into the page? Think of something like Kayak.com. Kayak.com is this flight and hotel search engine. So you get a page, you type a search, hit enter. The pa whole page doesn't necessarily uh, change, but rather some elements start populating the page. And you get a flight here, another flight here, another one here and here. So that's representative of this idea of getting back some kind of array of information that might very well be pretty long. So the argument that I've put forth with the earliest examples is that it's really easy to render XHTML server side. And it's clearly very easy to just jam it into your page by way of the inner HTML property. But the alternative, more elegant solution from a computer science perspective is to just return the data and then dynamically create the new nodes you want to insert into your web page. The gotcha is that doing something like this in a loop that's 1,000 iterations long or 100 iterations long empirically can take a while. And it's also going to become dependent on the speed of your user's browser. So it's actually been an interesting thing to watch discussions online of late about the performance of Firefox versus IE and the performance of Google Chrome. And these claims that our browser is faster at this and that isn't just about how fast they load pages anymore. It's about how fast they execute JavaScript code. And so one of the reasons that I still tend to rely on inner HTML is because I know the speed of my own server and I know how easy it is to pre-render the XHTML server side and then jam it into the DOM and stuff like this tends to be slow, it's sort of a trade-off. But sort of appreciating the various options is a useful thing. And you'll even find in the YUI library, and this is when I really got exposed to some of the underlying performance issues, they have this widget called a data table, which is a, re which is a nice mechanism for inserting a table into your page, a table that's automatically sortable by clicking the column headers, a data table that can automatically paginate itself. So it automatically gives you like numbers from 1 to 10, a la Facebook, so you can page through lots of tabular data. But even they, if you read the discussion groups about this widget or if you look at the actual source code, even they have run into things like this. Because if you're constantly updating this table with more and more information, even they discovered apparently that this kind of stuff tends to be slow. So they have the these workarounds, these hacks apparently, whereby they try to reuse DOM nodes. So they only create more nodes if they need more nodes. Otherwise, they reuse old nodes by just clobbering the values inside of them. So this is the kind of stuff that you really don't want to have to, I think, deal with, frankly. Um, and this is one of the reasons why inner HTML is just useful, if a bit inelegant. Um, but we can be even sexier than. Uh, then uh, blanking XML. So how can we actually manipulate um, the web pages using JSON? So JSON is simply uh, refers to the ability for your server to return a JavaScript array. Now, it's not a JavaScript array in the memory sense, because you can't send some of your RAM down to the browser, which is in the client. So you kind of have to send a temporary version of an array. So if I've got an array of cities inside of a PHP array, an associative array, I can simply pass that array 
to PHP's JSON encode function, what I'm going to get back is a string representation of that array. I can then send that string to the browser and then tell the browser, interpret this string as though it's a string representation of an array. And then the browser will take that string, it will parse it, and create in its own RAM, in your computer's RAM, the same exact array, but using JavaScript's approach to an array. And so what that does for us is the following. In AJAX 10, we have this interface here. Same as always, but what's going on underneath the hood is going to be a little different. So I'm going to type in Goog, click Get Quote, and what we'll see comes back is very similar to before. But notice this. Now my text area is a little more useful because this text area is now showing me not the whole page's XHTML. This time I'm using this little text area to show you what response text is. So response text is apparently a curly brace, a space, price, colon, a number, col comma, high, colon, number, comma, low, colon, and then another number, close curly brace. This is a string representation of an associative array that has three keys, price, high, and low, and each of those keys has one value. As we saw last week in some very simple JavaScript examples, and JavaScript has arrays as sort of a data type and also an object. And an object is the much more versatile of the two. And objects can have properties that are defined by way of comma separated lists of key, colon, value, comma, key, colon, value, comma. So what this suggests is that what I'm returning from the server is exactly that, a JavaScript object represented in a string form just as though a user typed it out. You typed it out in your own code. So that suggests then there's some way for my JavaScript code to take this seeming string, parse it, and put it back into a JavaScript object so that I can use like JavaScript's dot notation or the square brackets with quotes like the array notation to get at these properties. So if I take a look even more clearly, this is, a ja this is quote version 6. So if I do this, if I go to uh, quote 6, notice in quote 5 I got back XML. I'm not changing the symbol. Symbol still Goog. And I hit Enter. What I'm getting back in this world is a JSON string. Notice this is a little worrisome at first, but that's because the MIME type I'm returning, as we'll see, is application slash uh, JSON or text slash JavaScript. The browser doesn't want to just dump that into its window. It's, it's assuming, oh, you must want to download this. That's fine. Let me open it with TextPad. What am I getting back? Well, we already know what I'm getting back, just this string. So this is JSON. And it's equivalent in spirit to this XML uh, that I sent back a moment ago. But clearly, it's a little more compact, whereas I have uh, open and close tags here, at least in the JSON version, I only have the keys or the open tags, so to speak. So how do I manipulate this? Well, this is AJAX 10. So let's take a look at this code, AJAX 10. The quote function appears to be identical. There's really no magic there. But the handler function is now no longer, the handler function actually no longer has a name. Right, I got a little tired. Uh, I like anonymous functions because I don't like, just because I'm a bit anal, defining functions that I'm only going to call once. Why do I need to give it a name if I'm only going to call it once? So we saw last week and the week before you can have anonymous or lambda functions in JavaScript. Well, I alluded to that earlier. If I know I only need to register a function for the purpose of on ready state change, I don't need to give it a name like handler, define it separately. Why don't I just define it inline? And so just sort of a JavaScript nuance is exactly this. I've said xhr.onReadyStateChange equals not handler, but here's the function. So this is equivalent to what I described earlier, but rather than embed sort of weirdly the name handler, open paren, close paren, semicolon, I'm actually implementing the function inline, so to speak. So that's just a nice little stylistic or design decision. The rest of the code is similar in spirit. So let's check that ready state is 4. Let's check that the status is 200. But here's the interesting thing. And this is the piece of code that lets, um, that lets JSON work. So xhr.response text is just that string. We saw it in TextPad. We saw it in the text area. It's just a string. But that's a problem. It's just a string. It's not an in-memory object that I can manipulate in any way. So the means by which I tell JavaScript or the browser to parse that string and create from it an in-memory representation like any other JavaScript object is to call eval. Now eval is often frowned upon in many different languages as being very dangerous, and that's true. 
But fortunately, what I'm evaluating here is code that I myself generated. So I do have to trust myself, but I'm just generating from quote 6.php a string that represents an object. I'm not doing anything that's kind of security worrisome. So it's OK here. And the little hack you have to do, this is just the way you do it, is you eval not just xhr.responseText, but you surround it with parentheses. You can catenate it with an open paren and a closed paren. And you pass that resulting string to eval. And what eval will return to you is a reference to a JavaScript object in this case. So this one line of code converts string to JavaScript object, i.e. in RAM. So that's all it takes. At this point in the story, now I just have a JavaScript object, and I can use any of the tools in my toolkit to get at those key value pairs and insert them into the DOM. What I chose with Ajax10.html to do is to get the element by ID of code. So this code was just the text area. This was my debugging purpose. This was my little poor man's firebug here. So I could see response text. Well, now what am I doing? With that, with that object, well, like Ajax9, I'm creating a div. I'm creating a text node who's sim uh, with the symbol, colon, and then the quote. But how do I get the quote's price? Well, let me move this onto its own line. Notice that quote at this point in the story is a JavaScript object. It's the result of that eval call. But if it's just a JavaScript object, I can mentally rewind to last week, two weeks ago, the means by which you get key value pairs out of a JavaScript object is the name of the object dot key. Or name of the object bracket quote unquote bracket. Same thing. So that's it. So if you sort of have been eager to learn JSON, right, it's really not that hard. Right? All we have to make sure we do is generate a string that is a proper representation of an array. Now, how did I do that? Right, Because it looks like there might be a little bit of effort involved in maybe not spitting out the curly braces, but spitting out this comma-separated list. What if this is a more complicated object? What if I have an uh, object that has things like cities? And I want to return not just a city's zip code. I want to return a city's population, and a city's name, and a city's latitude, and a city's longitude, Right, a bunch of fields. There's going to be more to this object still. Plus, what if I want to return multiple cities? I might want to actually return not one object for one city, but an array of objects. Well, fortunately, PHP, a la the kitchen sink, makes this so easy. So we were talking about quote 6.php. How does this work? Well, notice what I've done here. So to get the quote here, I have to dive in and get, uh, let's see, the following. So what I did here, and I did a little bit of sanity checking, because I didn't. I, this is equivalent to checking for NA or an actual price, high, low, or price. So I have these three variables defined in this for loop after querying Yahoo. And I'm just declaring a variable, price, high, and low. And I'm getting them from the appropriate columns in the CSV file. And I'm just doing a little sanity check to make sure it's numeric and not, again, not applicable, or n slash a. Well, what am I outputting to output JSON? Well, in the past few examples, I've gone from outputting text separated by new lines, outputting XHTML separated by BRs, outputting XML to just outputting these values here, sort of the lazy, uh, the very simple approach. Right? Not lazy, it's just very clear. So I output the curly braces, and I output this comma-separated list of key value pairs. Well, I don't really need to do that. In quote 7.php, I can do this. All right, this is taking things up one notch. Uh, you might have used classes before, but this is kind of a nice way of doing this. If I point out the following, there's really no magic here. I, at the top of this file, decided, you know what? I'd kind of like to let PHP generate this string of JSON code for me. Maybe not because it's useful here, but I know I'm going to get to the point of having fairly complicated PHP structures, like an associative array with some really useful, interesting data inside of it. I don't want to have to manually figure out how to print out this comma separated list of key value pairs, especially if there's some nesting where one of my properties is itself an array or another object. Right? It very quickly gets messy. So let me try to get ahead of the curve and define at the top of this quote 7.php a class called stock. And it's just got three data members. They're all public because I really just want a wrapper here, like a struct. I don't need any methods or any fanciness. Public price, high and low. So just publicly available fields. But this is useful because I want to do this. Rather than just grab three variables, I want to tuck price high and low all inside of an object of type stock. So with these three lines of code, I now specify that stock price gets the first column, uh, stock high gets the second, stock low 
gets the third. So now in memory, I have this. Let's do a little sanity check. So print r of stock and then exit should give me this. So that's quote 7. So let me go to my quote examples. Quote 7.php for Goog is going to give me the following. I'm just doing a sort of data dump using print r just to see what's inside my PHP array. And again, once Yahoo cooperates, we see this, not worrisome, just means I'm spitting out a MIME type that the browser doesn't want to just show me in line. So I'm seeing this. All right, so this is probably a format that you're familiar with. That's what it looks like when you call print R. But that's not something I can give to JavaScript, right? JavaScript's going to choke on the word stock and object. It's going to choke on these square brackets. That is not JavaScript notation. It's not JSON. So what I need to do is invoke the kitchen sink. Turns out there is a JSON encode function. You pass it a PHP object. You pass it a PHP at array. It will convert it for you to the appropriate JavaScript format. And so to spend that back to the browser, all I have to do is print it. So it's really nice. And it really blurs the line between maintaining your data structures in uh, PHP code versus maintaining them in JavaScript code. Well, we can go one step further here. So this version here, so that actually embeds it in the page. Let's jump to this one here. Um, how can we simplify our lives a little bit? So in ajax12.html, we have the very similar interface. I'm going to type in Goog. I'm going to type get quote. But I'm really getting tired of all this copy and paste of this try and this catch and all of this cross uh, browser contention. So what's actually useful, whether you decide you like YUI or jQuery or any number of these other tools, even Google's API, as you may have seen already, comes with some of these AJAX uh, functions built in to abstract away the browser details, I can do the following. So I'm doing some includes at the top of this file for the Yahoo library, base library, the event library, and then this thing. There, Yahoo has what's called the connection library. And what this does for me is the following. I can now change my code to be a little more simply this. I create the URL I want to query, just like before. But then I call this function, yahoo.util.connect.asyncRequest. And it takes three things, quote unquote, get or post, the URL in question, and then a JavaScript object, which is a bunch of key value pairs. How do I know what keys are val valid? Well, I just check the documentation on YUI's site. And one of, the or one of the useful keys is the word success followed by colon, followed by the name of the function you want invoked if this function, if this AJAX call succeeds. And so now I've whittled down my AJAX program to that. It's really not that hard to get interesting AJAX code up and running, especially if you're using libraries that abstract away a lot of the setup. So next week we will take a look at more interesting examples still, and we'll see you then.